Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is a long-awaited episode on the Beethoven Sonata in D minor, uh, number 17, opus 31, number 2. I'm not going to go deep into the background on this piece, but uh, one thing that I would point you to is to look at what is happening in Beethoven's life at the time he's writing this. He's in Heiligenstadt. We all know of the famous Heiligenstadt Testament um, where he was contemplating suicide. A very tumultuous time in his life, and that should be reflected. The pain and tragedy in this piece um, should be very evident. So as you go into that, go into it with an appreciation and respect for what Beethoven was going through at that period in his life. This is often called the Tempest Sonata, but there are no uh, indications of the word Tempest on the um, publications from 1803. I believe he composed it in 1802, but it was published in 1803 after a whole mess of errors in the by the first guy who published it in haste um, and then they redid a bunch of um, they, they did a bunch of corrections to get the 1803 editions um, I'm going to be using the Arthur Schnabel edition today that's what I grew up learning and I have so many notes from uh, my teacher and some master classes that I did um, including one with Leon Fleischer that was very inspiring my teacher Susan Duhlmeyer studied with Leonard Shore and Leon Fleischer um, at Boston University so um, a lot of German heritage uh, there um, so far as there at, obviously uh, I believe it was um, Fleischer who had studied with Arthur Schnabel. I don't know if Leonard Shore had. Maybe he did as well. However, there's a lot that I have to say about this. So that's about as much as I want to get into the background of the piece. Um, I would also highly recommend spending the $5, download the Henley app, and, and spend the $5 to get the um, new uh, edition with fingerings by Murray Pariah. It's really, really brilliant. Now, I'm going to be demonstrating probably with all of my old fingerings today because they're just ingrained. And by the way, you can watch me perform this on YouTube. Um, but some of these fingerings like right there uh, if I was to learn this piece for the first time or I was just in the early stages of learning it now you're seeing this tutorial um, I would go I would consider pariah's fingering one four three two three two one four three two three two it's really easy until you get to a really proficient level of piano playing, and even then it's still a temptation to, if you're using fingerings like what Schnabel has, one, three, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, uh, one, three, three, two, three, two. When you're using like one, three, three, two, it's really easy to accent that second iteration of the repeated finger and have it be uh, too tense. So that's all I'm going to say about the, the Henley edition is I really did enjoy those new fingerings from Murray Pariah. So make sure to spend that little extra bit of money. You're going to be investing so many hours into this piece. It's good to have additions to compare it to. All right, getting started. Let's put down that una corda pedal. And I'd, it's been very a very, very long time, probably 20 years since uh, I read The Tempest in middle school, I think it was. <laughs> so I don't really remember much from that. But we want to feel that polarization in this piece. So this opening is as magical, this magical sound, this magical world. Start counting from your top note of the roll, by the way. So don't start counting one and two and three and a lot of students make that mistake and it's largo it's very slow so one sorry one e and a two e and a three and a four e and a one now i'm counting in four it's actually written in cut time so you could you could count Okay, sometimes I'll just count in 4-4 four, four, even when it's cut time with students just to get uh, enough subdivisions down. That's a really important concept. I actually have um, a little quote that I wrote down from that Fleischer uh, master class. He says, when playing a slow movement or anything slow, subdivide the beat in your mind um, and insert a few extra notes for practice to lower your blood pressure a few points. <laughs> so 
what he's saying there, a little piece of advice, because students have a tendency to rush that first part. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. Practicing like that can help you feel all of those full values uh, of those notes, because I don't care who you are, if your adrenaline is pumping, your mind is going to warp time. You're going to think that you held it longer. A lot of times I've performed and I've gone through like a fast Chopin etude or something and I thought, oh, that's pretty fast. And then I listened back to my recording. I was like, whoa, that's a lot faster than I thought I was playing. So adrenaline and pressure can do weird things. That's why that little exercise I just showed you is so helpful. Okay. Um, another piece of advice, flatten your fingers a bit and just pull back on the keys slightly. Okay, and I like it to grow a little bit up to there. Two, three, fermata, then. Okay, a few things about that. First of all, don't break your pedal. For, for a while, when I was really young, I went, and I kind of lifted my pedal and then came in, I just like to connect it right into it, okay? So you're holding, 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 and then off. So tricorde right on that, okay? I always had a tendency as well to go to there, to there, and feel those beats. And then the final one, I would drive all, all the way to that uh, ending chord right there before I cadence back to A major. Okay. Um, Fleischer said it would be even more full of angst if you went and then to there, and then to there, and then to there. Okay, so. And I agree, that has a lot more anxiety infused into it. So I, I really like that idea. Um, one thing Susan told me uh, is she said to articulate these slurs. One way you can articulate slurs, and just a good idea in general when you're playing slurs, is to always remember more or less, more or less, more or less, more or less. And for these three two tr uh, slurs, if you slightly flatten the fingers, for some reason this passage feels really good with a little bit more surface area on that key rather than, you know, these really sharp fingers. That still feels fine and sounds fine. It's just a little bit more comfortable. And I think it's easier to uh, manipulate your sound that way. Okay, so I'm just using three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two the entire time. Okay, and I just want little moves here dynamically. And then two there, and then two there, and then the big crescendo to there. Now this is adagio, so we're quite a bit slower than we were just in that allegro. So one E and a t that's too slow. One E and a two E and a three, something like that. And I believe there's some freedom right there. So I don't think that you have to be like like really rhythmic with that one e and a two e and a three and kind of settle into that now fermata so you want to hold three e and a four e and a plus a fermata remember we're going back to those polarizing characters okay very soft change your pedal and put your soft pedal down your unicorda pedal far left pedal count from your top note open that up just a little bit crescendo to the c It's almost like these drops of water falling into this perfectly still lake. Very, very peaceful. And then start soft. Okay, now 
in my opinion, um, and, and I'm probably the only person who's ever going to say this, that was the, these were like the hardest bars of the whole movement for me because I didn't want to get tense. Now, my playing has improved a lot since I um, played this piece when I was a young teenager. One thing that my um, brilliant colleague, Robert Dorso, who's a master Taubman teacher, um, talks about that it's a fundamental Taubman technique is rotate back to there. Okay, now this would require a double rotation if you're gonna use that same finger. Okay, now I'm gonna rotate to the right and then back to the left, right. Now double rotation, so I'm going back to the right so I can go left, rotate back. That really helps. Now, those are new concepts for me. We've worked in some lessons over the last six or eight months, and I've learned so much from him. He's brilliant. Um, that can help to really loosen the hand. Um, especially if you're going to do those repeated fingerings like Schnabel has here. Uh, if you do the Murray Pryor recording, it's a little bit easier when you're switching your fingers. One, three, four, something like that. So mess around with both of those fingerings and see which one you like a little bit better. Let me just quickly review this. Okay. So one, four, three, two, three, two, one, four, five, two, one, four, five, two, one, four, five, two, one, four, five, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, two, three, four. Okay, and I just felt a stronger fingering, but the possibility of more tension if you do five, two, two, three, five, two, two, three, five, two, two, three. So if you're gonna use this, make sure you're doing those proper rotations in there. Uh, another thing that I really liked that Fleischer had said is he's.